Uh, probably the most important part is that uh, I want to invite you, for the folks that I'm, I guess that you guys are staying in the supercomputing, uh, so if you didn't receive a, a personal invite, uh, it's because I wanted to come here and actually personally invite you. <laughs> so, uh, so you're invited to join us uh, at the annual Benelux event that's going to happen on Wednesday uh, at 6.30 at the Hilton which is like four blocks away from the conference. Um, they're going to be advertisers and uh, our CEO is going to be on stage and he will host um, Dan from Tech and uh, we have uh, folks from Microsoft talking about Azure and Dan Adder, Geo. Um, I think Jensen is going to be there and, and discuss a little bit uh, from his perspective. Um, and after that you know, semi-boring part, uh, we'll have uh, uh, Preacher Wilson, which I don't know if you recognize um, I did it, sorry. Um, <laughs> he was one of the finalists of AGT, American Growth Talent in 2012. Uh, so it's a stand-up committee, and after that, we're going to be So you're more than welcome to, uh, to join us. Um, for it, to register, the simplest way is go to brownhawks.com slash sc19, and uh, all the information there, you can register, and I'll have to see you there. So that was the most important part. Now let's go to the um, second part. Uh, so first, a little bit about uh, um, us, or kind of the, the connections to us. Um, we are very, very proud to be uh, used on the six of the top ten um, supercomputers on the top 500 list. Um, the, the first two and then the last here on the tenth are uh, power based with the EDR and Philip uh, There is a couple of others. Um, tech is the one that uh, uh, utilizes HDR in Finiband, so they are in the latest generation. And I guess it's probably going to be the fastest TOF 500 system uh, in 2019 uh, that's going to be on the list. Now, from, from the Merlux perspective, uh, we're focusing on, on the helping the transition from uh, a data, from a CPU centric architecture to a data centric architecture. Which means that uh, moving from uh, building a data center that is focused on the GPUs or CPUs only and that the network is just a pipe to move data between uh, the compute elements uh, to a, a data centric approach where the focus is on the data and the fastest you analyze data or the ability to analyze growing amount of data, that's the most important part. Um, so the idea is to move compute to the data and not data to the compute and as part of the transition, the network becomes an IO processing unit or an IPU. So if we had CPUs and then GPUs um, came in, um, now IPUs appear as a coprocessor. It's an element that enables to uh, 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 not just accelerate data in that sense, but the ability also to, to bring computational capabilities within a network to be part of uh, the process itself or, or uh, the job itself. Uh, one simple example which uh, I typically show is doing data reductions, but it's just a simple example. Uh, so for data reductions or aggregations, um, if uh, uh, the, the uh, um, previous idea is that uh, everything runs on the CPUs or GPUs, so you move data all the way from all of the processes to a single process that will do the data reduction, um, and then potentially do the broadcast back. The main issue with that is that that process or that uh, element takes a good amount of time and when you're running a, a reduction operation, for example, then everything else is stalled and waiting for that uh, uh, operation to be completed. Um, trying to reduce the latency here by adding more CPUs is actually going the opposite way. Um, and trying just to focus on reducing the, the network latency um, also doesn't work anymore because the network latency today is in the range of uh, nanoseconds. Um, if you look on Finibin switch, it's around 100 nanoseconds. If you look on the Finibin adapter, it's around 150 nanoseconds. So even if you get the network latency to be completely zero, you're going to cut another one, two microseconds from a 40 microsecond operation, which is who cares. Um, so the idea here is that instead of running the reduction on uh, the CPU, for example, or GPU, you can actually do it on the network devices. 
So you can put, we can put compute engines on the switch data paths, and those compute engines can do the data reductions. Um, and also the, the broadcast back or the barrier. Uh, and in that case, you can actually dramatically reduce the latency of those operations. Uh, now there are several uh, advantages here. Is one that you can essentially get almost flat latency, because the network the switch doesn't really care how many nodes exist in a system. Um, you reduce data motion, which is important, and then you also reduce the CPU utilization. So that's one example, and essentially there is uh, uh, more examples. And uh, we, we kind of look on the network uh, technology as uh, uh, four different stacks, or so four different pillars. And we try to bring innovation and smart capabilities in each of them. Uh, the first one is, is the connectivity pillar, which is the base of building topologies and so forth. Um, multiple systems or many systems using loss network, but essentially you can build a different kind of topologies if it's drawn off like plasma perspective or TORS or HyperQ. Uh, we're working on a new one which is called HyperX, for example, um, and you can build a topology that match in a more uh, efficient way the, the process that you want to run on top of that. Um, on the network pillar, this is where we deal with the network functions and what we did from our perspective from the beginning is moving the network functions to be done on the network, which includes uh, full transport offload and then doing RDMA to move data from user space to user space without the input of the CPU. And then we had a GPU direct RDMA, which is uh, do the same thing for the GPU memory. Um, we added capabilities of resiliency, of what we call shield, um, things around adaptive routing, congestion control, and so forth. Uh, the third one is the communication framework. And in my eyes, that's kind of the more interesting part. Um, the idea behind uh, communication framework offload is you move as much as you can from the data path of the communication framework from the CPU to be, to be done on the network. So it includes MPI or Schmann Vegas or UPC or Nickel, for example, if you're looking on uh, uh, deep learning, uh, so moving, doing the data reductions and doing the matching, and you can do rendezvous. Um, and essentially, we also have the capability to uh, uh, what we call software defined uh, virtual devices. And the idea here is that um, if you have compute engines um, on the network adapter, then I can run multiple algorithms and I can actually program that to do multiple things. But they can also program the device to pretend to be any other piece express device that exists. One example, I can program the network adapter to pretend to be an NVMe or flash device. And in, in that case, um, the software running on a server thinks that there is a local NVMe, essentially almost unlimited local NVMe, but the network adapter uh, capture all those piece express commands coming down as NVMe commands. Uh, and then translate it to something that actually go on the wire, the same thing with fabrics to a JPOV, get the response back, and then resemble uh, a local response on NVMe back to the application. So we can pretend to be NVMe devices, and essentially can pretend to be any PCI Express device that exists. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's open a new uh, capabilities in the future, which we'll probably uh, we'll talk further in the future. Uh, and then the last part is going all the way to the application space. So here, we, we're trying to move common frameworks or, or common algorithms from the most used frameworks to the network, but with the programmability that exists, essentially you can take it also to the application level. And here, um, users can actually uh, take some of the algorithms and decide if they want to run those algorithms directly on the network or keep it on the CPU or split and doing asynchronous progress between those two and so forth. Uh, so I'll try to touch a little bit on a couple of the, the, the elements here. Uh, the first one is Sharp, and I hope that most of you know about Sharp. Uh, Sharp is our name for doing data reduction or aggregation on the network. Um, Sharp uh, essentially today is the second generation of it. Uh, the first generation was implemented in the EDR devices. Um, and that element or that technology was uh, focusing on low latency reductions. 
So it covered the small message sizes, something that's more prominent for, for HPC workloads. The HDR generation has the second generation of Sharp, where we extended the data reduction from just the low latency also to streaming uh, reductions. Uh, and it's mainly for uh, deep learning, for example. So in, in this uh, capability technology, the switch has uh, uh, compute engines that sits on a data path. And it, can, it does all the data uh, manipulation elements that you can think about, integer floating point, and basically you can program that to do reduction uh, or broadcast. And the way that it works is that the host, the servers connected to the switch will send pieces of information that, uh, for the data reduction, uh, the switch layers will do the data reductions among the host, will send the information to the second level of switches, and then the reduction will be over, and then the switch will do the broadcast back. Uh, so in that case, don't really care how many nodes exist, uh, and essentially you can get flat latencies. Uh, and this is a, a few examples of uh, latency numbers or performance numbers. Uh, left side is uh, uh, doing MPI or reduce, for 8 bytes or 128 bytes, and here it's a 1 kilobyte or 2 kilobyte. The dash lines, it's uh, doing the reduction on the CPU side, and then the solid is the latency on the hardware, on the network. So beyond of, uh, small jumps when you cross a, a tier of switches, you essentially get flat latencies. Um, this one is from uh, uh, Cyanet. Uh, or from the University of Toronto, uh, a 1500 node cluster, uh, 40 processes per node, so in this case, running uh, MPI or reduce on 60,000 MPI racks. Uh, different message sizes, and you can see the latency on the CPU versus the latency uh, on the network. Uh, and this is an example from Summit. Uh, barrier on 512 nodes, uh, CPU or software base versus the hardware base, and then doing reduction the same way, software versus hardware. Uh, now, uh, with HDR, uh, we added capabilities of doing streaming reductions, which means now it's uh, effective to take it into the deep learning side of things. Uh, we're working to incorporate Sharp into Nickel. So uh, Nickel is the Vita Collective Communication Library, uh, and what you see here, it's four nodes with 32 GPUs, and then uh, three cases. Uh, the yellow one is uh, uh, having one infinite adapter per server or per box. Uh, the blue one is two adapters per box, and then the green one is four infinite adapters per box. And then you can do, uh, and, and what we test here is actually the bandwidth of uh, reduction bandwidth. <coughs> Um, you can build Nickel in a, in a tree topology or do it in a ring topology and the, the integration of Sharp and Nickel actually gives almost 2x performance cost. Uh, so that's, that's the reason on, on incorporating that. Uh, there is some work on running uh, uh, full applications of different users uh, which demonstrating 30-40% performance boost. Um, those numbers might be announced next week or maybe in a few weeks. So that's around that part. Uh, another element that we're moving is doing matching, matching on the network. So here uh, I stole board, board, two slides from Ticket Panda, uh, one slide from Ticket Panda. Um, I'll return the slide back to you after this talk. Um, and uh, uh, DK has brought uh, hardware attack matching or, or support hardware attack matching into a uh, So I stole from his presentation, or uh, from his presentation, two graphs. One of them is looking on uh, eager latency, the other one is looking on ice cutter V. Um, so on eager, uh, small message is not much of an impact, but there is a nice reduction latency when you go to the mid size messages. Uh, and then you can see the, the improvement in the other collective operations. Uh, another element that we are uh, providing is quality of service. Um, and apparently, while there is a good usage of quality of service outside of the, the core HPC world, um, with people running MPI jobs, for example, running different kind of workloads on the same wire, we don't see uh, too much usage of quality of service, which we think is a miss. Um, 
the Feynman provide a very uh, fine granularity of quality of service. So essentially you can uh, define different attributes to storage traffic or MPI traffic, or you can define different attributes between different MPI users, for example, um, and give latency guaranteed or bandwidth guaranteed or play in, uh, in any sort of way. Uh, typically, uh, when running people running multiple MPI jobs, those are running in a same quality of service. But there is the ability to nicely uh, uh, provide uh, different uh, quality of service capabilities between different users or between different uh, jobs. Uh, another element is congestion control. And uh, congestion control existed in InfiniBand for many years. Uh, we did the first testing or the first experiences uh, with congestion control 10 years ago. Uh, so we, I was part of the paper done together with the Simula lab from Norway. Uh, where back then we looked on the first experience of congestion control. So 10 years ago it was QDR and DDR at that time. Um, and what we did there is we built a fabric with two switches that have QDR or 40 gigabit between them. Um, and then all the servers were connected in DDR, so 20 gigabit per second uh, to the fabric. And the idea was to create vector flows and then see how uh, congestion control can solve those, that kind of uh, uh, issue. So what we did, we did uh, run one flow that was point to point between two servers. And then we start building many to one flow. And the idea we have many to one flow is to fill the buffers and the switches and create congestions and, and start uh, try to create a vector flow, uh, which is what we did. So if you see here, uh, uh, I don't know if it's too small, but without using congestion, uh, we start just running the point to point, and the point to point got full wire speed. Um, and then we added another, the second flow, and since each one of them running 20 gigabit per second, and the pipe between the switches is 40 then each one of them get the maximum bandwidth they can get. So the speed of 40 half and half. And then we start to add uh, other flows uh, to create many to one. And once we start to create many to one, we create congestion, uh, which spread and actually created the impact on this flow and created the victim flow. And what happened here is that all the bandwidth went down, um, including the victim flow, which is not supposed to get impacted uh, in the many to one scenario. Uh, sorry for blocking the view from uh, And then uh, we enable congestion control in Philippe, and what happened is that uh, the victim flow stopped to become victim, and uh, it, it received the full wire speed, and when we start creating the many to one, then the many to one actually split the bandwidth between themselves almost in equal share. Uh, so you can see here we added more, uh, more streams and creating four to four many to one, um, and the victim flow stopped to become victim. Uh, so that was 10 years ago, uh, with QDR and, and DDR. Um, and now with the HDR generation, we uh, continue to enhance the capabilities of congestion control. Um, and we did some testing recently on a new benchmark uh, that was created uh, for looking on congestion impact, which is the GPC net benchmark. Um, and I think there is a company, not putting names, uh, that put some results of running GPC net GPC net benchmark on, on different clusters. Uh, for the folks who were not familiar with the GPC net benchmark, uh, this benchmark runs uh, three cases. Uh, it runs random ring latency, it runs random ring bandwidth, and run all of this latency. Um, and each case it's run twice. So in the first case, it takes half of the nodes, just from a high level perspective, half of the nodes to run uh, just run to bring latency, for example, while the second half of the nodes are doing nothing. And then you run it again, keeping the same half of the nodes running the run to bring latency, for example, but the second half of the nodes now just to, started to eject uh, throughput or data to the fabric to create congestion. So now you have latency uh, without the congestion, and you have latency after the congestion, and you uh, uh, divide one in another, and you get the congestion impact. So if the congestion impact is 10, it means that the latency with congestion was 10x worse versus the latency without the congestion. Um, and you do, you do that for run-to-ring latency, for run-to-ring bounds, and then on the news. 
so there were results that were published around running uh, that benchmark on, on ARIS systems. And you can look at the congestion. By the way, the bar is the average, and then the line above that, that's the worst case scenario. Um, so you see that on ARIS, the congestion impact is in the range of 1,000. It's kind of a logarithmic scale. Um, the benchmark was run on, on some infinite system, EDR, uh, but without our involvement and without setting uh, congestion capabilities. Uh, so the congestion impact here was much better than ARIS, in the range of uh, 50, uh, give or take. Um, and then it was also published the simulations uh, on Slingshot showing that it's a one point something range. Uh, we did run uh, the benchmark on HDR, which has a, a more advanced congestion control mechanism. Um, and we run the benchmark without enabling the congestion control mechanism and with enabling the congestion control. So without enabling congestion control, you get similar results to what were tested, more or less, which made sense. Um, and then with congestion control, you get uh, pretty much one. And the worst case scenario, it's almost nothing yeah, above that. Uh, so that, that's the, the capabilities of uh, InfiniBand, not just from an in-network computing capabilities, but also from uh, congestion control uh, and adaptive routing. Um, and those results I borrowed uh, from a paper that was released by uh, uh, Oak Ridge and even more than IBM uh, and some other folks, uh, which run MPI graph. Uh, on Summit and looked on the network efficiency without or with static routing and then looked on the network efficiency with adaptive routing uh, demonstrating 96% network utilization uh, which is a, a good number. Uh, so from a, a solution uh, on our side, HDR Infiniband is uh, uh, what we provide now is the best network out there. Uh, it's included all of the components as an end-to-end -end, from the network adapter to the switches and software and everything around that. Uh, not doing too much uh, on the product side, but uh, we did announce on Thursday a two new product to the Infiniman family. Uh, the first one was Quantum Long Reach, which is a box that extends Infiniman uh, reach to up to 40 kilometers. And that, that, that box enables to actually have a, a native RDMA between remote data centers, ability to do uh, uh, data reductions between two sides, the ability to do the adaptive routing, position control, and other things between uh, remote data centers. So you actually can uh, use those boxes and, and take remote data centers and build one virtual supercomputer. Uh, or you can have the box sits in a um, scientist desk next to a, a workstation or a server and then that person can run things on the local server and uh, extend the job into the uh, cluster uh, around them and so forth. So there is a nice um, usage with this box. Uh, and then the other one is the, the new gateway uh, for Infinite and Ethernet that uh, uh, provides support for 100 and 200 gigabit per second InfiniBand to 100 and 200 gigabit per second Ethernet. So from our side, uh, what we're trying to focus is to enable not just computing capability on the network, but also the fastest, the lowest latency within uh, the data center. Um, and any addition of Ethernet into the high-performance computing fabric will impact the latency. Uh, we knew it from a past experience, and you can also see it in, in new attempts to do the same thing. So we want to maintain the lowest latency, and if you need to go to external Ethernet networks, then you can use it. Uh, you can use the, the gateway, and it does it in a very efficient way, and doing 200 gig on uh, on both sides. Uh, so overall, uh, there is uh, definitely great capabilities that you can leverage from InfiniBand. Uh, the network utilization with the routing I mentioned before. Uh, using the, the reduction operations on the network, uh, resiliency, um, and then um, uh, looking on the cloud perspective, then Azure has now HDR, 20 MB per second InfiniBand in Azure. So you can run virtual machines to connect it with InfiniBand. Um, I think they posted several application cases and they're showing very, very nice scalability to uh, uh, tens of thousands of cores. Uh, and and there are uh, focusing on, on InfiniBand in order to bring the low latency, uh, supporting Sharp uh, on, on Azure and the rest of the things that I mentioned. Uh, 
So this is where we are today. Uh, we are working on the next generation. We're going to 400 gigabit per second. Uh, it's not going to be too far from now that uh, we're going to introduce the next generation of infinity band going from 200 gigabit per second to 400 gigabit per second. There are going to be more features, more elements moving from uh, communication frameworks down to the network uh, and so forth. Uh, so overall, if you look on the entire map, there is a great capability of programmability here, which you can take advantage in order to split workloads and run part of the workloads or part of the algorithms on the network, be able to do a synchronous progress between the two sides, uh, be able to reach to infinite bit storage or to Ethernet storage through the uh, new gateway and then ability to do actually long, uh, long reach capabilities uh, between remote, uh, remote data centers. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening and remind you the first night, we have a personal invite from my side uh, to come on Wednesday night at the Bronx event. Thank you.